Hey guys, today I'm going to review my latest eBay acquisition, which is a rare 7415 storage oscilloscope from Tektronix. This scope was only made in uh, 1969 and 1970. It was the first storage oscilloscope in the 7000 line, which is a line of scopes that lasted for, I think, 15 or 20 years. It is, uh, like I said, a, a, a rare model. They did some improvements in, I think, 70, 71 to the actual mainframe unit here. And because of that, this unit was discontinued really quickly. That's a great thing because it's rare. It's a bad thing because the availability of service manuals and stuff for free online is a little bit limited but uh, it seems to be a great scope uh, so far, at least have great potential. And I uh, just wanna give you a quick tour of it. So the unit was sold to me as for parts are not working. And if you've uh, been on eBay a lot, you'll notice that a lot of times people don't really know what they're selling and they will sell, you know, a complex piece of test equipment as for parts are not working. Well, in this particular case, this unit is definitely not working. Doesn't power up at all. The unit itself is a mainframe with plugins. So you can actually get these 7000 series plugins to do different functions on the mainframe itself. The mainframe is more or less just an oscilloscope display, but on the 7415, there's a couple of cool things. The first thing is the uh, storage function. So it has the ability to store the waveforms that you're looking at. It also has a character generation system uh, which for 1969 is really cool. So there's actually a set of uh, chips in here that will uh, generate characters and it allows each module to display a few characters of information on the screen. In this era, you know, that's almost unheard of. This is a pretty revolutionary feature. So it's quite cool that, it, that this system has it. And I'm really uh, hoping to get this unit running because I think it would be uh, a lot of fun to have that uh, character display going on my oscilloscope. This is the first mainframe or one of the first that, that supports these modules. And they didn't change the standard for the modules themselves uh, during the manufacturing period, which is cool because, you know, you can buy a module that was made in 1981, plug it into this thing, which was built in 69, and it will actually work. With this scope, it uh, came with four modules. So dual trace amplifier is the uh, first module here. A differential amplifier, which is a, a, a lot of fun and, and a pretty valuable piece of equipment uh, with an oscilloscope. It has a voltmeter, which is really exciting. So I should be able to uh, use this voltmeter and see the voltages on the screen. Uh, and it'll give me you know, a nice uh, accurate voltmeter I can use for my hobby work. In 2017, of course, a handheld fluke voltmeter is gonna be a lot better than something like this, or certainly a lot more convenient, but it's gonna be a lot less cool. So I like that. And the last module here is the dual time base. If you're familiar with oscilloscopes, you know, a typical oscilloscope is gonna have this dual trace amplifier, and it's gonna have a, uh, a time base of some sort uh, built into it. So these two really provide my oscilloscope functions. This module provides the differential amplifier so I can do those differential measurements. And the last one, of course, is the voltmeter. One thing I love about this machine is that if you're familiar with tech Tektronix equipment, it's pretty robust, but this one is just like over the top. Like if you hear that switch, it just goes, oh wow, such a nice sound. I just like switching it off and on. That's really wonderful. Uh, it's really hardcore as far as the quality is concerned. This is, you know, a high-end piece of test equipment. So excited about that. These little buttons here are, are quite small, uh, but they're, uh, you know, lighted and it's a, it's a nice user interface. These buttons here also light up as you select each module. And, you know, these sort of clear buttons with the uh, incandescent lights in, the, in them are, uh, you know, straight out of the 60s. And, and I, I don't know, they just look cool. These units were from an era where test equipment was definitely meant to be serviced. And, uh, you know, let's uh, not hold back and let's take a look at this thing, see what we got inside. There's four screws that turn half a turn to open it up and then each of these side panels comes off and you can see the circuitry inside. So here's the first board. I'm not entirely sure what it is. It looks like it may be one of the amplifier boards. There's a sweep marking here. There's output signal. Interesting thing about this is that each of the transistors is socketed. Uh, this is from an era when a 
transistor, you know, was actually worth some money. Now these things are, you know, fractions of a penny, but they were valuable enough at the time to uh, socket them so that uh, they could be replaced uh, easily if they blew. This next board is actually uh, one of the cool ones. It is the character generation system, and this was like totally new technology back in the 60s. You've got to remember, uh, like a mainframe computer in the 60s may or may not have a video terminal at all on it. This is new stuff, and so you can see there's some 16-pin chips. They are pretty much all custom, except there is a, uh, uh, I think this is a 74LS chip right there. All of the contacts are all gold-plated. All of these contacts where the board connects into the uh, mainframe, they're all gold-plated. Probably if I can't get this working, I mean, it would be sacrilege to do it, but I think I could recover my investment just by melting it down uh, for the gold. This is the low voltage regulator board. Again, we've got our transistors all socketed, nicely socketed there. Some big old resistors there. And there are four fuses on this regulator board. The uh, board is a low voltage regulator which in 1969 was 15 volts on this output here and uh, or on this test point and on this one 50 volts and 75 volts and 150 volts. So in summary low voltages on this equipment are really high com compared to today's standards and they're also very dangerous so if you're you know monkeying around with an old oscilloscope make sure you know what you're doing. Um, if you don't know what you're doing you know, get someone else to uh, <laughs> help you out before you uh, plug this in and, and start to uh, play with it. So if you look inside, there's a box that says warning high voltage. Now in 1969, high voltage is like thousands of volts. Don't open this uh, unless you know what you're doing. I'm not gonna open it. I encourage, uh, you know, if you got a similar scope at home, uh, don't do the same unless you uh, know what you're you're getting into. Okay, let's uh, turn this guy around and see what we got on the other side. Thing's heavy. This is probably 75 pounds. Not light at all. Okay, so here we've got the CRT. The CRT is encased in metal it seems. I know that uh, Tektronics in this era they were making uh, CRTs with ceramic basically out of ceramic tubes so it was a ceramic glass combination and there's a couple of videos on YouTube you can find that have description of how they built those ceramic tubes which was a cool thing at the time. One interesting thing that they've got on this is this point-to-point -point wiring. This style of point-to-point -point wiring is a big Tektronics thing and uh, they were quite proud of it. Now if you've ever worked on old radios, uh, old radios are all point to point so they would take you know a resistor and they'd solder it directly to a capacitor or whatever uh, and it would just be like a jumble of wires. That process is great if you're having humans assemble your stuff, not so great if you're having a robot assemble it or you know a machine. Tektronics built this uh, or came up with this system of doing point-to-point -point wiring, which use these uh, ceramic dealies, and they have in them, uh, maybe these ones you can see pr pretty clearly, uh, the ceramic, and then there's an actual, there's a conductor here, and they basically go in and they attach the component to the conductor there, they'll attach the other component to it, and they solder in there in order to make the point-to-point -point connections. And this was, you know, something that uh, helped simplify the assembly of these units. Tektronics literally, you know, made millions and millions of these things. And like I said, they were quite proud of their invention. Oh, look at the dust on this thing. I uh, think I'm going to clean this up, you know, as part of repairing it. I'll do a little uh, bit of a restoration because this stuff is pretty gross. One of the things that's fun about this hobby is you can sometimes uh, get some history out of the equipment that you've uh, purchased. This module here has got a, a Triumph asset sticker on it, which is uh, kind of cool because that's the nuclear lab at the University of British Columbia. Over here we've got the vertical amplifier, the vertical output, 
and it's a uh, you know pretty standard amplifier layout here. What's really interesting is there's these two transistors, and this is a, another Tektronics ism. There's your transistors mounted there. It's quite interesting this actual layout that they have, and sort of a neat thing about the layout of the, the, the scope itself is that your vertical amplifier sits vertically and then if we go up here a little bit up on the top here sitting horizontally is your horizontal amp so if you ever forget which is which well vertical vertical horizontal horizontal how easy is that something else neat on the scope is this here which is you know it's a coil of looks like copper that's encapsulated in some plastic of some sort that is a delay line and a delay line is 1969's version of dynamic memory so it's actually a really uh, neat concept there's lots of videos talking about delay lines on on youtube you can look it up if you're interested but basically with dynamic memory you know even modern chips what happens is 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 it only stores them that information for a fraction of a second and what the system needs to do is it needs to refresh those memory locations continuously so that it will keep its contents and this is why on your average computer if you shut it off it forgets what it was doing when you turn it back on again i mean there obviously there are strategies to deal with that swapping to disk and you know using static ram and things like this but um uh, generally speaking, your main memory on a computer is going to be dynamic RAM, which forgets when the power is unplugged. This is the same thing, except it only stores a few bytes of information. And the way it works is, is there's a transducer on one side of this coil, and it will pulse out information into the coil. And there's a certain number of milliseconds that it takes for that sound to travel through the coil, or it can also, it, it may be sound or it could be another type of vibration. So some uh, delay lines work through torsion and basically twisting the delay line ever so slightly and having those twists traverse down the delay line itself. But anyways, what happens is, is that uh, the information travels through this very fast and then it comes out on the other side. And then if it's still needed, it's basically popped back into the delay line so that it travels again. That allows you to store information for as long as you want, as long as you keep refreshing that delay line. Now, the delay line doesn't store a lot of info, but you know it stores enough to uh, work in the, the, the scope itself. And um, you know, to be honest, I don't know, but the information is likely actually analog information that's being stored in the delay line as opposed to digital ones and zeros. Uh, the uh, display and storage on this unit are gonna be all analog, I would think. Uh, although, you know, so I might be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know. But uh, it, it would be an analog system whereby you're storing waveforms, you know, as varying sound waves or torsion waves in that delay line. Near the back of the unit, we've got our main power supply. Uh, you can probably see some capacitors in there. If you've worked in equipment of this age, you'll know that the capacitors are typically a problem. They dry out, they leak, they, they dead short, and uh, this unit is likely the same in that the capacitors are all gone, they need to be replaced, and that would explain why the system actually doesn't power up. So I'm hoping that's the case. I'll pull that out and in another video, maybe I'll go through the repair process and uh, show you guys how I fix this thing. I'm assuming I can fix it. This board here is the backplane board. It is mostly interconnects into the uh, card cage. And so take a little look at the card cage now. Okay, so uh, each of the modules can be removed from the mainframe. There you go, there's one of the modules. And inside, at the very back, there's a connector in there. I'll try to get a shot of that connector. So you can see at the very back, there's a, uh, a white card edge connector. And you see on this side, we've got a uh, card edge that the module plugs into. Just slides in, there you go. And uh, you know, this is a pretty revolutionary concept for the era to have these modular sorts of plugins. If you're a big fan of, you know, 60 Cinema, 
this kind of actually reminds me of the memory modules in 2001 Space Odyssey. I think that's just great. So there you have it. Here's one of the modules. This is the uh, 7A12 uh, dual trace amp. It's really cool as far as you know construction is concerned. It's all aluminum, very nice. And uh, if you're a font fan like I am, oh, it's got that nice 60s font. It's just beautiful. I mean, this is like straight out of uh, you know 2001 Space Odyssey or any number of uh, cool things of the era. So popping the top off there, a little bit of drama. Um, we can see again, we've got a few chips and they're uh, 14 pin chips it looks like. Uh, they all appear to be custom chips as well. And uh, you know, uh, again, you know, we've got our transistors all socketed in here. This seems strangely corroded. I'm not sure what that's all about, but we've got our adjustments underneath this plate. I'm not even sure what kind of material that is. It's uh, some sort of metal of some sort. I'm not sure. Uh, gold plated, you know, everything's gold plated. It looks like, you know, I don't know, are the board traces gold? Who knows? This was built, you know, uh, without a budget essentially. I mean, these machines were the equivalent of 20, 30 grand today. So, you know, cost wasn't an issue. And it, uh, they may all be gold plated traces. I'm not sure. This unit is quite neat. This is the spring loaded unit for selecting switching unit for selecting the volts per division uh, and so each one is interconnected here and so they pop up but it looks like I've got some issues uh, some of these buttons aren't quite working but I'll work on that maybe some lubrication will be fine the bottom you can see uh, there's actually two boards here one on each side we'll pull this cover off and take a look what's on the other side And here we've got you know, the boards on the other side. So now this is a dual trace amplifier. And I'm going to guess that probably the boards are very similar on both sides. And they are. So it looks like this is one channel uh, amplifier. This is probably the other channel amplifier. This is uh, control logic, control circuitry for the two channels. This unit here has got to send the signals to the display board that I showed you earlier. So probably these chips here are helping to interface with that display board. So there's some digital information that's actually going to the display board that tells it what to uh, uh, show on the screen. And you know, I've alluded to this uh, before that, you know, digital information in 1969 in a, uh, you know, small piece of equipment is relatively rare. Most stuff at that era was analog. So this is an interesting hybrid of both analog and digital technologies. Now in the back of the unit, there's a switchable power source there. It's uh, permanently connected with some sort of weird connector deal. It doesn't unplug or anything like that. There's a fuse under this little cabinet to pull out. And to switch the voltage, you need to pull this thing off. And you can switch it from uh, 120 to 2, 240 volts. So there's a uh, your fuse container and the little switch to switch between voltages is here, which is kind of a cool little arrangement. If you want to see more videos on rare and questionably useful equipment, uh, please subscribe to my channel. Us small YouTube producers, we really need your subscriptions these days. Uh, so I would really appreciate it. You know, if you feel it in your heart to subscribe, that would be great. Be really happy with that. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me uh, in my uh, future videos.